So here we are on to our very last topic for the semester, social change. And I know that a good handful of you are not even 20 years old yet, but you have a grasp of recent history. So I want you to think about what are the various changes that have happened from the last 20 years, so from 2000 to 2020. What, if you think about our political systems, the way that politics operate, um, possibly divisiveness between political ideologies, and then also our approaches to our approach to religious beliefs and religious communities and things along those lines. So what kind of changes can you kind of think through in relation to that? Safety and security. Oh my goodness gracious, the changes in safety and security in the last five months, let alone 20 years. And so we have certainly had some major events um, in our society that have led to changes in our safety and security. So what have been some of those changes? Media and communication. Quite honestly, I would challenge you to think what hasn't changed? Like, how many modes of media are bare, like barely hanging on and almost ex extinct? Where we have news resources like newspapers, right? Most of their like presentation and usefulness and a, like where they get attention is their online articles. So newspapers being printed, even magazines and things, those are becoming quickly, quickly extinct in many, many ways. Um, I have a home phone. That's a very kind of rare thing to have nowadays. We have phones, as you darn well know, that are, I mean, the equivalent of a complete and total computer in so many ways, if you think about the last 20 years. 20 years ago, people still had pagers and cell phones that could make phone calls, but and it wasn't ubiquitous. It's not as if everybody had a cell phone and relied on it. It was still at that point something that some people had, but certainly not everyone. So again, I would really challenge you to think about what are the like what has stayed the same because arguably everything has changed in media and communication. And then think through some other changes. We have changes in relation to marriage equality in our society. Um, we have changes in relation to the way our institutions work, our education changes, and things like that. So just to kind of brainstorm for yourself, where have you seen lots and lots of change take place? Because we live through it, right? So we started this class talking about crayons and how sociology is like a box of crayons, and we know everything going into what we're studying this semester. This is, again, we've had all of these various aspects of our society change right in front of us, but now let's dig into that 64 crayon box, right? Let's take a look at it a little bit more specifically and um, with like more minute analysis. So, okay, moving on. What we're going to do is kind of a true false game. So I need you to decide the following statements if they're true or false. The people shall rule. So I, I know you might be like, well, what does that even mean? So number one, decide what you just think that means. And I'll talk about it in a second. But kind of come up with your idea of what does the people shall rule even mean? And then once you've got that, go, well, is that true or is that false? Okay, you ready? Um, and if you're not ready, pause me. Right? That's, that's the magic of these lectures. You can stop me at any time. So the people shall rule. First of all, here's the questions. What people? Who's ruling? And how did they get that power? So sometimes when students talk about this, they talk about like, it's our government, it's our politicians. Well, how did they get there? Well, we voted for them. So then does that mean the general public, the people shall rule? And shall, does that mean they should rule? Or does that mean they do rule? So again, like where is the power? Who gets to make decisions? Who gets placed in positions of power in our society? How does that happen? What this statement actually comes from is community organizing, but I use it for more than that because I think it really brings to light all those things I was just asking, like who has power? How do they get it? How do they maintain it? Things along those lines. The people shall rule. The idea with community organizing is if you are a trained community organizer who has a job to go in and help a community, you don't come in and go, oh my goodness, there's this wrong and this wrong and this wrong and this is how we're going to fix it and who's going to sign up to help me with this? And like you were supposed to come in, sit down, and listen. The people shall rule. The people of the community should tell you 
what it is you need to be working on. They should set your path. They should set your priorities. They should set your goals, not the other way around. You don't come in to tell a community as a community organizer what they should do. They tell you what they need. Okay, next true or false. If you're not fighting for what you want, you don't want it enough. So do you think that's true or is it false? So let's start to break down the words in here too. I get really nerdy about words in this particular like activity. We would have been doing this activity uh, together in class. And so everybody would be yelling true, false, that kind of thing. Um, first of all, fighting. What do you think of when you think of fighting? Right? Because I think of usually like you're yelling or you're punching somebody in the nose or something. I'm not, I'm not endorsing fighting in that way, but I'm just saying that that's, you know, fighting has a level of kind of angry, borderline violent energy to it. And so do we need to be fighting? Do we need to be yelling to get what we want? And what are the things that we could want, right? So thinking about, um, quite honestly, what's going on in our society right now, there's so much tension between what people want and what might or might not be good for our overall health and wellness and well-being of our, you know, of all, every individual. So that idea of want, but what happens? Because there's many people that definitely want things, but they don't have the opportunities to fight for them. And so does that mean that they don't want it enough? Because think about how this layers in with social privilege, socioeconomic status, what we covered with social inequalities a handful of weeks ago. So what happens if you change want to need? If you're not fighting for what you need, you do not need it enough. What happens if you change if you're not fighting for what other people need? You don't want it enough. Not everybody has the opportunity to fight for what they need. And so to think through if you are a person that has various societal privileges, whether it's socioeconomic status, whether it's racial privilege, whether it's gender privilege, and you're not fighting, and fighting cannot necessarily always mean that it has to be anger-induced, but you're not out there trying to make a difference for what others need, can you really say that you want it enough? You know... You know with this class that there's not always nice, neat answers, right? Um, and in the future, if you would like classes with nice, neat answers, we have that whole big, pretty math and science building at SCC, and there's lots of answers in that building. In our classroom, whether it's this virtual classroom that we have now or the classroom together, I don't necessarily have answers to all the myriads of questions I'm asking, but that doesn't mean that the questions still aren't important to ask and to think about and to kind of debate with ourselves. Okay, next one. Nobody's going to come to the meeting unless they have a reason to come to the meeting. Is that true or is that false? So sometimes students will say, well, like meetings for work and stuff like that. Like, well, you know, people will go to those. Well, because you have a reason to, you've been told that you have to, it's because of your job, right? But I want you to think about the last time you walked around on campus and you saw that there was a meeting of some kind of student organization going on. Did you go? Sometimes people do. But do you go to a lot of them? Do you go to any of them? What would get you to go? Because that's what we're talking about here. Nobody's going to come to the meeting unless they have a reason to come to the meeting. How do all those flyers around campus or signs around campus give you a reason? What's maybe one of the motivating factors to get people in a room? Usually when I ask this together in class, everybody yells out, food. <laughs> so I then ask. And so if you were thinking that, you know, it's been a common occurrence. And if I say, what food? Usually, sometimes people, there's a, there's a runner up, but the vast majority of the time, students go, pizza. And then sometimes donuts, but usually pizza. So then I ask everyone. So you've incentivized. Let's say you are the person who's in charge of the group, right? And you're trying to get other people to join. And you have scraped together 20 bucks between, you know, a handful of people that are willing to kind of be leaders in this group. And you went down the street to Valentino's and you got some, you know, large one topping pizzas. Do you want the pizza people? Do you want the people that walk into the classroom or wherever you're meeting because they saw a sign that said free pizza? So, Because a lot of times people, when uh, students will say, no, no, we don't want those pizza people. But I'll ask again. 
do you want the pizza people? Because you got to think the pizza people are going to be polite. And that's a lot of P sounds, right? <laughs> the pizza people are going to be polite. They may not necessarily, they're probably going to try to get their piece of pizza and head out of there. But if you corner them, they'll give you like a polite three, four minutes of their time so that you can tell them what the meeting's about, right? That's your chance. Have you ever heard of the elevator pitch, right? The idea that if you are in an elevator um, with the, you know, head of a company, a president of a company, a company you work for, and what's an elevator? An elevator is a closed off room and it's just the two of you. You have a captive audience. Like if you were going to say anything right now, they'd have to listen to you because there's no way around it. They can't ignore you. You're standing right there. So if you only had this time of an elevator ride, and an elevator ride, even in a large building, would be, you know, 60 seconds. If you packed in something to get their attention, to get them to understand, to get them motivated, to get them to do something that you need and or want, that's what an elevator pitch is, to sell somebody on something and to get them, you know, motivated on your side. So pizza people are going to give you the, at least the chance to, you know, do that. And they'll be like, oh my gosh, yes, this is so interesting. Sure, I'll put my email address on your piece of paper. Oh, you know what? Gosh, I, I really appreciate God. I need to, I have, a, I have another meeting to go to. Bye-bye, right? But they're going to give you a chance to at least say something. So how would you motivate people to get involved? Because again, when we're talking about if you're not fighting for what you want, you don't want it enough. We're talking about social change. How does social change happen? The people shall rule. Who has power? How does social change happen? Nobody's going to come to the meeting unless they have a reason to come to the meeting. How do you get people motivated to create social change? These meetings that I've been talking about, it's this kind of organizing meetings that you want to make a difference and you need people to help you. How do you get them there? Okay, one more. You're like, why is there a bulldozer at the top of this slide? Because of this. The bulldozers are coming. You'll be out on the street tomorrow. That really needs to have exclamation points at the end of it, and I always forget to put them in. Um, is far better than, would you like to be a part of the community planning process? True or false? I'll take a sip of water while you decide. So if you think about what's going on, what's the motivating factor with the first statement, All right? The bulldozers are coming. You'll be out on the street tomorrow. Like your house is being torn down. You're going to lose everything. How do you feel in that moment when you're being told that? Freaking terrified, right? Like terrified. Oh my gosh, what are you talking about? Where are they coming from? Why are they going to, like that kind of thing. You're frantic. What happens when somebody comes around that door? Because again, this is about motivating, motivating people. Somebody comes door to door, knock, knock, knock. Bulldozers are coming, bulldozers, bulldozers. What happens when all of a sudden the bulldozers don't come tomorrow? They, they exaggerated. You know what I mean? The next time they come knocking on your door, knock, 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 the bulldozers are coming. Are you gonna believe them as much? I don't know. Because uh, if this were, you know, four or five years ago, it would seem to be a foregone conclusion that if somebody were dishonest or really exaggerated, they would lose credibility. Nobody would listen to them anymore. Based upon governmental leadership and political positions in our society over the last few years, I don't know if you lose credibility. But I will tell you this, fear is incredibly motivating. Is it good? No. Is it right? No. Is it fair, kind, just, respectful? No, none of those things but it's powerful. It's incredibly powerful. So to think about, you're scaring somebody. The bulldozers are coming. That's going to get people motivated to fight back. No, this is not okay. I, I need to stop with the yelling voice, right? More than just saying to somebody, would you like to be a part of the community planning process? Because that person can be like, oh my gosh, I would love to, but you know what? I've got my kids that I have to take to soccer and I've got to do this and I've got to do that and I have to stay late at work and people will get out of that. So again, how do you get people motivated? to create social change. That's what we're talking about here. Be reflective, right? Be reflective for yourself. Where do you get the ideas that when you've answered true or false, when you've kind of had these thoughts as I've been talking about possibly, you know, an argumentation to what I'm saying, which would be awesome, which is why I miss you so much. Or like just, you know, debating various aspects of this, bringing in a, you know, idea or a motivation that I wouldn't even think of. Like, where are you getting those ideas from? So thinking about where, where you get the thoughts that you have, being reflective. Now, for some of us, 
we're not totally comfortable with being activists for social change. But I do want to cover what it does take to become an activist. And then I'm going to talk about the rest of us who maybe don't feel as drawn to activism and the things that they, we can do. So, and we'll talk about why it's we in a second. So to become an activist, you have to decide what you just feel is completely inherently unfair and what needs to change. Decide what makes you mad. And then you have to learn about all the intricacies of that particular issue. It's not that you just can have surface level knowledge. You have to be a voracious learner about all aspects of this issue. You have to find other people to share in um, your desire to make change and you need to team up and work together and you need to be organized and make a plan and recruit other people to want to join in by asking for help and you need to talk about it all the time in order to get people to join in and team up and help you make a plan. The thing is you learn the issue but you need to continuously relearn and find out what all the updates are to the various issues. So you need to stay in the know. And then you need to celebrate small victories and not give up because a lot of times social change is a long haul. When I teach Introduction to Women's Studies, we talk about women's history and we talk about the Seneca Falls Convention, which was the kickoff of the first women's movement. And it was in, I believe I'm going off the top of my head, I think it was like 1856, maybe 1854, I think 1856, July 19th and 20th, 1856. You can Google it and see if I'm right. I know the July 19th and 20th is. One of the things at the Seneca Falls Convention that Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott were fighting for was women's right to vote. And caveat, asterisk, qualification, all women, no, white women. That's an important uh, like part of our history that oftentimes gets written over. And it is, again, inherently horrifyingly unfair and disrespectful. And so I always want to make sure that I do not leave history just stating you know, they were fighting for women's right to vote, not all women. The, okay, I always get this confused because I think it's the 19th Amendment, but it's 2020, or 1920 that it passed. And like, is it the 20th Amendment? And it was 1919. But it took, maybe the Seneca Falls Convention was in 1852. <laughs> it was in the 1800s, the middle of the 1800s. Trust me on that. It took... 70 years almost, I believe, between the Seneca Falls Convention and the fight for women's right to vote for it to actually happen. There was only one woman present at the Seneca Falls Convention that was even alive to vote. It took a lifetime, and social change oftentimes takes that. So you need to make sure you're celebrating the small victories when it happens and make sure to buoy your energies to not give up. Okay, so now what can you do if you're not activist-minded? Because I got to admit to you, I'm not a particularly activist-minded in the, like, if well, think about it. If you're not fighting for what you want, you don't want it enough. If you're not fighting for what others need, you do not want it enough. Activism takes all different shapes and sizes in some ways. So when you talk about being an activist a lot of times, that means the person out there with a bullhorn yelling and getting people's attention and, you know, trying to you know, push through with that kind of energy all the time. That's how I perceive activism. For those of you who were like, uh, yeah, don't hand me the bullhorn. I'm okay, thanks. Here's things that we all can do to help create social change. You're doing one right now, learning. And you've been doing one all semester, listening and reading. And I really do hope that you continue to read and listen to various sources. You've done one all semester. Also, you are a collegially trained writer right? All those papers that you probably don't love writing, that is training you to be a college educated writer, which is not an opportunity that everybody gets. Your ability to organize argumentation and be a clear communicator via, via writing is not necessarily a skill that everyone has, and you can utilize that many, many times, whether it's an email or even just a paper letter that people empower politicians, they always have somebody on their staff that is tasked with reading all of that. And if you write and say something incredibly compelling and tell a story or give a viewpoint, and that politician, local or otherwise, sees that, granted, because somebody who works in government, at, you know, in a political figure, they do have power to create social change on you know, a much more macro level than individuals who do not have that political power have. It is not unheard of by any means. I, I know several people who have been 
people who reach out and write to various political leaders and they are asked to come meet with them and talk about, and it's not because I have friends in lofty places. It, it's a mom in the Orange Unified School District whose one child has um, struggled with um, type one diabetes and all the various challenges. She has learned the issue and she took the time to write politicians and local politicians, congressmen and women have called her in to be on task force and help out. Writing matters. And so that is something that you are all very capable of doing. You know some of the other ones of these that make a big difference. You can volunteer and you can donate and you can continue to have conversations. There's so much that we have covered in this class, whether it's social inequalities, whether it's gender and things, whether it's race, we've packed a lot in. And to have one conversation with someone, you have no idea what difference that might make. One of the things we very much started with at the beginning of this class is that one of the goals, one of the learning goals in this class is to be an empathetic learner. And so you can empathize. You can start to say, wait a second. What has this person gone through? What can I do to you know, understand what their path is as opposed to what, where do I have privilege and I might not be thinking about struggles that they have? And then finally, you can vote. That is not, again, a privilege that everybody is afforded in our society. And oh my goodness, what year am I talking about this? An election year. And you have seen in your lifetime, as you talk about social change at the beginning of this lecture, you have seen the power of, and granted, we can be, we can be, um, I can't think of the word, uh, cynical. We can be cynical and be like, oh, does our vote really matter? I can't get into a big debate about the um, electoral college. I am not an expert in those matters. I am not a political science professor. But I can tell you on a local level, I have seen very much because I have been involved in a couple of the different recent, actually three now, local elections where I have seen that school board members and um, a lot of times uh, like measures to do school improvements and things can really be won or lost by mere hundreds of votes. So granted, I can't speak with a high level of intelligence about the debate whether your vote matters on a national level, but I would default mechanism to the fact that it does. But I definitely know that local politics matter enormously and your vote very much matters there. And to be an educated, engaged voter can be a huge way to help create social change in your society. I just mentioned too, how many things did we cover in this class? Sociology and learning sociology and using sociological ideas creates an inordinate amount of change. Here's case control theory. Deviant acts occur when one's bonds to society are weak or broken. Weston Zimmerman's definition of gender, that it is routine and methodical and a reoccurring accomplishment. Socialization and norms and positive and negative sanctions and how people get punished for not following norms and how norms change and sociological imagination and how this intersection of history and biography, goodness gracious, when I said that at the beginning of the semester and it was the first concept that we covered, could we have seen the way the end of the semester would be? No. What we are all collectively with facing various challenges and things, but living through right now, that is going to be a part of both history and our biography, that intersection between the two. We're being shaped by everything in the society right now. We will be different people by the end of this year. And to have these sociologically analytical skills to study this for ourselves can be so key to creating social change. And so if you're thinking, well, wait a second, I'm just one person, like what can I do? And because there's certainly, I just showed Martin Luther King, basically um, one of our most prestigious sociology majors ever, right? Not every person can make change on a massive society-wide scale, which is why we talked about becoming an activist, but we also talked about what everybody can do, whether it's reading one article, having one conversation, donating, you know, every chance that you get, maybe if it's only $5. For those of you who haven't heard of the butterfly effect, because I have this image up and you're like, what's the butterfly effect? What are you talking about? 
The butterfly effect um, is a concept, I think it was Edward, Edward Lorenz, who was a meteorologist, was doing mathematical equations to, to uh, study aspects of weather events and made a tiny, and this is back, I believe, in the 1950s, but, you know, I didn't know when the Seneca Falls Convention is, so you can't trust me. When computers were these humongous machines, right? So typed in this big, long equation and made this minuscule change to it. And then went and I guess had lunch or something, like walked away so the computer could work out this mathematical equation. And when he came back, he realized that tiny change that he made to these humongous numbers actually resulted in the equation being really significantly different. And so he used his knowledge of meteorology and weather, right, that's what it is, to kind of symbolize that change he saw mathematically. Basically, the idea is if you see a butterfly, and it's springtime, right? We've seen lots of butterflies. Remember last year when there was the butterfly migration? That was so cool. And all the butterflies were um, fluttering through, right? So think about the last time you saw a butterfly flapping its wings. And actually, as I'm talking right now, I'm flapping my arms like my hands, right? Your butterflies. The idea was that a butterfly fluttering, flapping its wings, can create momentum in our atmosphere that can grow and grow and be so impactful that it could cause a major weather event like a tornado or a hurricane. But it starts with that one little flutter. When you use that in relation to social change, that's a really empowering idea. Now granted, here's the thing, I always teach social change as my classes are wrapping up. Um, I actually have a birthday in May, so about a month ago. And so when I was actually teaching social change in one of my other classes, it was wrapping up at the beginning of May. My dad had called me on my birthday. I was driving to school and, you know, happy birthday. And, oh, what are you doing today? I'm like, oh, I'm on my way to school. Oh, what are you teaching today? He asked. And I said, oh, I'm teaching social change and, you know, the butterfly effect and all these things. And he's like, well, you know, Hitler may have created a lot of social change. And I'm like, Dad, because when I'm thinking social change, I'm thinking puppies and rainbows and butterflies and, you know, equality and equity and respect of all human beings and everything else. But he had a point. And that's something that I always now kind of, again, make a caveat for. Like, you also can create an inordinate amount of social change, even small negative behaviors can create that kind of momentum too. So quite honestly, yes, this can go either way. But in those moments where you worry that we do need a more equitable society, we do need a more caring society, we do need a more empathy, we do need understanding, that we do need things to change, think of the butterfly effect. Think of the butterfly effect and think about the fact that I can make small changes and that can add up, that can create momentum. Take ownership of that, that we all have that power. And kind of when we talked about the first night and I broke out the crayons and I said, you know, that sociology, and I told you it was a cheesy line then, that sociology makes your life more colorful, I will end this class on an equally cheesy line. Use what you've got, use what you've learned in this class, right? Because otherwise it doesn't matter. You can shut off this lecture and just go on with your life and it doesn't matter but go be the butterflies. Go be my butterflies. Go take the things that you've learned and share them. Go use them. Go make sociology matter. Go be the butterflies. Like I said, it's cheesy. Okay, I, I will save my like weepy goodbyes for more announcements and things as class wraps up, but with my voice, because this will be the last time you're hearing my voice, I, I just want to say thank you. This class certainly has been through more than I hope any other class, like any other semester of classes has to go through, especially with the rapid change to virtual learning. The fact that, you know, as opposed to being together and getting to do activities, we've had to, you know, work on them as discussion boards or listen about them in a lecture. And you all have done such a remarkable, amazing job. Your thoughtfulness, your respect for each other, your camaraderie, your humor. I have just been so incredibly lucky to get to spend such an unconventional semester with you all. <laughs>